should see in a minute. Getting me. Is you should right. see stop record. You should see Paul is recording. Yep. It's okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So in the white corner, in, hailing from Wales, is Mr. Paul Skirm, and in the grey corner, it's Mr. John Ward from Dorset. I'm your referee. Seconds out. Podcast one. Ding ding. Oh cool. yeah, trim it easy, and we'll go in. <coughs> Yeah, we're right. Five, four. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another E5 podcast. And this is one that we have been waiting for for some time. I am your host, Paul Meenan. I am joined by my regular tag team partner. Introduce yourself. Hello, I'm JW. And we are now finally introduced by a fellow E5, a one who we, uh, to quote David Watts, we cherish dearly. Um, and we have been psyching ourselves up for this for some time because we're going to go deep. We're going to go technical. And I think this is going to be the first in a series of uh, technical and legislative uh, talks where we really discuss the things that impact the industry uh, and um, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Paul Skirm, one of the five founders, and um, as I say, it's one of my. I, I, I did one podcast a while ago, but I haven't done any for quite a while now. No, you you have been busy fixing and repairing the world, to say the least. Mm. Um, right, so Paul, you're you're back. This is one that we've talked about many many a time. Um, so let's get into it. So for those for those listening out there who are one man band trademen, whether they're designers or they're engineers or specifiers. Um, it, I think it's fair to say um, occasionally electricity can be a, a quite a weird phenomenon. Um, I know there's the, the trade term electricery, which is which is a bit of a play on words. But um, I, I think I told a story in a podcast once. Uh, John, I, I don't know if you remember this, but I was working on a railway station called Shepherd's Bush. And we put some um, I think they were design plan or, or an, an, a competitor of design plans lights into uh, a linear boom system that goes above the platform. And we put some, uh, they were all dally dimmable. And the day we installed um, these lights, um, everything was fine. And um, hang on a second, let me just mute something. Um, the day we installed these lights, everything was fine. But one of the biggest problems we had was when the train came through in the morning, all the lights started to dim, or they went into flash mode, or they decided to behave in a way which we didn't expect. Now, the dimming feature was a passive feature that wasn't actually connected, but it turned out it was a electromagnetic phenomenon, which was uh, convincing the drivers that there was a control signal of sufficient energy to make it behave in the way it was behaving. And it took a lot of it dumbfounded everybody and it took a lot of time to figure it out. And that was my first introduction to EMC. And when I looked into it, I went and did a training course and it just introduced me to this world of directives and all sorts of stuff that not many of us know about so do you want to kind of take us on that journey paul from where we may know because we know the wiring rigs and uh, yeah. we know there's requirements in it for um electromagnetic uh, phenomena uh you know emc surge protection lightning protection um electromagnetic compatibility but tell us about the hierarchy of legislation in your world well, yeah, so I don't know whether most of the guys know out there. Most of my work these days is, uh, well, I come from the machinery side of the industry, as it were. So so my background's in in electromechanical machinery, manufacturing machinery, uh, plant systems, stuff like that. So I've um, I've always been involved in machinery safety and, and safety systems and things. So what we're going to try and cover tonight is a, is a very brief overview of the kind of legislation and requirements that come down from actually from Europe but it's all UK law now so Brexit or no Brexit we're stuck with it or whatever the case may be it's UK legislation and uh, we're going to cover some of the stuff that Sparks may not or well, may or may not be aware of that they may be working away blissfully at, uh, without realizing they're actually not working in compliance with the law so if we split it out, we just cover the three main um, kind of directives, I think, that will affect electricians. There's dozens, you know. Um, but if we stick with the three kind of product-orientated ones for a moment, 
That's the low voltage directive, the machinery directive, and the EMC directive. Now, Paul's just given us a, a little bit of a talk there about the EMC directive and the sort of things you can see with that. Well, now, the machinery directive is related to, well, as it sounds, machinery. And that transposes into a piece of UK legislation called the Supply of Machinery Safety Regulations. It's UK law. Uh, it mirrors the, um, the machinery directive, requires all pretty much the same things as the machinery directive. Uh, the requirements are for the, basically whatever machinery and stuff to be safe. Uh, and you would want to achieve that by various. It's a go, it's a piece of legislation that's goal setting. It's not prescriptive. It doesn't say in the same way that BS seven six seven one gives you lots of, lots of detail, because BS seven six seven one, whilst we call it a regulations, is actually just a British standard. So, what we're talking about here is genuine regulations. It's genuine law. It's made under the Health and Safety Work Act nineteen seventy four. Not complying with it is a criminal offence. Sounds very serious already, doesn't it? Mm. Uh, and it but it's true. Non-compliance with the machinery directive, non-compliance with the low voltage directive, non-compliance with the EC, EMC directive is a breach of law. You can go to jail. Okay, Paul, Depending can I interject? Serious, yes. So, okay, so you've just told us there's three, there's three very important directives amongst dozens of yes, directives that exist. Now, where do these directives come from? They come from European legislation. The, as I say, the machinery directive is the piece of UK law. Um, we, we've blamed Europe for a lot of the legislation, the law that we've been, shall I say, saddled with over the last few years, when in actual fact, um, a lot of it actually stems from UK legislation. Um, in Europe, they don't have the Health and Safety Work Act 1974. They don't have that. And a lot of the European legislation and a lot of the, the safety work that's come out and the requirements stems from that act. We were world leaders in looking after people at work, even back in the 1970s, because that was a groundbreaking piece of legislation. And the fact that it stood the test of time since 1974 with minor changes speaks volumes, really. Because the, the laws of physics haven't changed, you know, our biology hasn't changed. So we still have to look after people. Well, if you if you if you go, if you're anyone interested in uh, furthering their own learning or CPD knowledge, um, you can look up Edwards versus Coalboard um, to see the um, the even predating the Health and Safety at Work Act, the Factories Act and various. Sadly, every legislation comes with a disaster or the ruining of someone's family or a death or an incident. So when people always say it's a regulation, even like premature collapse, it's come from somebody's death. Somebody had to pass. Someone's family was destroyed. And this is why I think in our trade, arguing over regulations, I personally find it, I find it a very fine line between a healthy debate uh, or a misinterpretation of a requirement but to argue over a regulation, I, I try and avoid that because it's it's too sore a subject matter when you look at where it came from. And I, I've got to try and try and draw a distinction here. And we, we all do it and I do it. I, I, I go through phases where I will remember not to call BS 7671 regulations and call them clauses because they are merely clauses in a standard. When it comes to regulations, we're talking about statute law such as the provision use of work equipment regulations, the electricity at work regulations. They are the laws which we have to comply with. BS 7671 is a trade standard which gives a means to compliance with the law. So um, when amalgamation across Europe started and legislation started to become standardized across Europe, um, Back in the late 80s, 1989, um, there was a, the first machinery directive was, was formed, um, but it wasn't implemented until 1992. Okay. So maybe kind of three years there, three and a half years, I think it was, between the time the legislation was made and the time that it had, it, it actually became law in Europe. And okay. it was only after, then after that, 
after that, did it become a requirement for the, the states in Europe, the countries in Europe, to implement that in their own local legislation? And ours became the Supply and Machinery Safety Regulations, as it happens in 1992, not long after. I think there was a six month. I'd, I'd have to look it up because I can never remember these figures. But I think it was six months after it came in, or was it maybe the date, the end of December 92 that it came in? Um, and then it became UK law as well. So what that meant was basically there was a, a standard set of uh, ex expectations is probably the best way, safety expectations for machinery, which were then supposed to be standard across Europe, the UK, Italy, France, Germany, right across the whole of the European economic area, so that a piece of machinery could be built to meet these goal setting standards, so it wouldn't ideally wouldn't hurt anybody. And that piece of machinery could then be uplifted and moved elsewhere in Europe without it having to be modified in any way. Or it could be sold into any European country without having to be modified and customized for each individual marketplace. Because that was one of the free, the fundamentals, the cornerstones of the European economic area was free movement of goods. So just, just to clarify then, so basically these directives are, are effectively implemented by the European courts, effectively. They're made law in this country by the Health and Safety at Work Act, which is the primary legisla enabling legislation for They're workplace safety. For yeah. And yeah. the principles, and stop me if I'm wrong here, the principles of the directives, regardless of what subject matter is, is to lay down a common framework of rules to protect persons and allow products to go between European countries um, without causing mass harm, deaths, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah. there's some basically level fundamental... Would, you, would, would it be fair to say that these directives are actually a set of fundamental principles in their own right? Yeah, yeah, they are. I, I don't think that's an unreasonable thing to say. They set up, they set out the machinery directive. They're called, um, without getting into too much detail, because we'll cover the machinery directive in, in detail in another podcast. The, 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 the goal-setting requirements in the machinery directive are called the essential health and safety requirements. That's it. And they're yeah. a list of, 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 of items that a piece of machinery must meet. They're just goal setting. They're not, um, they're not prescriptive. They don't say how to meet it. They don't say, um, they, don't, they don't give well, you well, details can... on what's required to, to meet that. I can chip in and just say, having recently read the LV directive and the machinery directive for some work I'm doing, um, I actually thought they were very, very clear and unambiguous. So, for instance, the machinery directive is very clear that says adequate lighting will be provided for machinery. That's not a, a, a speculative comment. That's you will give adequate lighting. You will ensure that any moving parts cannot cause entrapment of limbs. That's very, very, very clear. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's clear to the point of this is like a school teacher telling you these are the rules for the playground. These are the rules for algebra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll go, just bring one other thing up there. You were yeah. saying, um, describing how the, the requirements are worded. Now, there's three particular terms that are used in standards and legislation. Um, shall, must and should. And they crop up in BSM six seven one if you if you if you think about it. They do. Now a shall the shall is well, you really should do this. If you don't, you better have a blinking good reason why you're not. not yeah. You know? A shall is you're gonna do it. If you don't do it, you're in the deep stuff if it goes wrong. And must is exactly the same thing. You must do this, you know? Think of the health and safety signs, the blue signs, the mandatory ones, you know, mm -hmm. the shall and the must are your blue mandatory. You must wear PP. You must wear your, your eye protection. You must wear your hearing protection. You know, mm -hmm. they are mandatory requirements. And it's the same in law. We have shalls and musts and, sh and should in the legislation. It's and those are the key. bits that you have to follow. In fairness, it's a key word. If anybody learning the electricity at work regulations. It's in there um, as well, isn't it? Yeah. If you want to learn which of the regulations are mandatory rather than reasonably practicable which is a balance of time and cost just yeah. look for the word shall in the regulation mm. it's a really simple quick tool when you're having a debate about a standard or a piece of legislation look for the key word shall and that's a great start for 10 i think yeah absolutely absolutely 
So uh, where um, should we go on a little bit and say, well, yes. okay, so how does the machinery directive apply to electricians? Electricians don't work on machinery. Most electricians don't work on machinery. Yeah. Okay. You know, no, domestic electricians never work on machinery, do they? Well, John was the other day. He's a domestic yes. electrician. Yep. Yeah, John. Well, this is the uh, electric gate situation, isn't it? Electric uh, gates, yes. Yeah. Electric gates, roller, electric roller shutter doors. Yeah. They come Garage under the machinery doors. directive. Yeah, it's um, okay, John. You're not mentioned in the directive, by the way. No. Don't flatter yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, roller shutter doors, um, even automatic leaf doors are machinery. Um, the Door and Hardware Federation, you know, to give them a plug, to be fair, they're the trade body. They've got some good guidance out there. Um, so what else have we got? What have I said? Um, oh, gates and barriers. You know these these car park barriers. They're machinery. So even if Sparks working on them, they need to be sure that they're complying with the requirements for those particular pieces of machinery. And BSM six seven one stops at the point of connection to the incoming supplies. If you've got a, a big rotary isolator, a big red and yellow isolator, we'll cover that another day. We're not going into red and yellow isolators today. Yeah, um, no. <laughs> that's regulation 110.2, exclusions from scope. If anyone's listening. One, one, yeah, no, wait, yeah, one, 110 to uh, XI, in it? XI exclusions yeah. from scope. Um, so where you've got that big red and yellow isolator that isolates your roller shutter door or your gate or your whatever it is, that is where BSM 671 stops. It doesn't apply to any of the wiring on the door. It doesn't apply to any of the wiring on the, the gate, whatever. Okay. You go into a completely new raft of standards. EN 60204-1 is the general standard for machinery wiring. Um, we'll cover so just, cover the different kinds of standards when we do the machinery directive. I was going to say, rather than so, it's fairly evident. Like uh, again, taking this back to the for the electrician. So yeah. for for an electrician, we know there's the wiring regulations, there's the electricity work regulations, and yeah. above that, we've got Health and Safety Work Act. What yeah. we now have is a series of directives that we assume, and it's and it and this is the whole point of uh, uh, debating this. A lot of people assume that when we buy a product or a component or the guidance we seek from manufacturers' instructions and the wine regulations would be suitable and sufficient, and I use that term deliberately to protect us from any form of prosecution. However, in in and and this is why we've why Paul is doing this talk is. Paul, in his role as a machinery and electrical expert, you found there are there are gaps where you assume a lighting product is compliant. But in actual fact, That's if the right. manufacturer doesn't do the due diligence against the directives and all of these other huge volumes of standards. I mean, in the back of the regs, there's a list of other standards. OK, now me and I you mean. could probably double this or triple it. Yeah. Yeah. But an electrician yeah. or an electrical contractor is mm. assumed when they're engaged by an employer to know this. Now, in a domestic house, slightly different. You're just expected to not kill the family and burn the house down and do a decent job. But when you start going into, when you bring more technology into a home, like EV chargers, where I believe there's a regulation now, John, I can't remember it off the top of my head, where the, the guy who installs the EV unit is now responsible for checking its compliance against a directive. We're now seeing that in 7671. The first introduction of these directives for an electrician to verify and validate. Now, well, where's yeah? Haven't I mean, we got a piece already in seven six seven one? No, from a while back. Um, let me just get my my copy of seven six seven one up. You guys okay. are advanced. You have paper. I don't have paper. So, for those listening, we are consulting the big blue books. Um, um, I, still, I, I don't. I, I don't have a digital book. description uh, subscription yet. But but one of the things is Amendment 1 introduced, um, I'm sure it was Amendment 1, there was a regulation that uh, required the, 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 the person who installed the EV unit to um, ensure its compliance with the various LV and EMC directives. One of the biggest challenges that has is, and we see it on social media quite a lot, there are people who go and install downlighters, but the downlighters will fail. And everyone go, oh, they're cheap rubbish, they're cheap crap, they failed on me, which affects an electrician's reputation, their warranties, they um, you know, they've got to do reworks, at zero cost. It's an absolute pain. But the trouble is, is every electrician listening to this sitting in their van is um, if I turn around to you and say, how long have you got to spend your time doing due, due diligence on every single product out there? 
every electrician listening is going to go, I haven't got time for that. I'm running a business. I'm a sole trader or, or I expect other people to do it if I'm not a sole trader. The problem is, is in my experience, and this is where I think me and you, Paul, harmonize, is in your career, you've seen this in machinery and other bigger plant. In my career in railways, I fell into this from an accident where lights were flickering into this. OK, every single major product that I invest money into, I want to see declarations of compliance, but more important, evidence of due diligence. Has anybody picked up that directive, read that directive against the, the product that they've built? And it's <coughs> absolutely yeah. frightening, Paul as to how many products out there do not comply with these very, very European high level legislative obligations. Which are also UK law. I mean, if you look at 511.1, yeah. uh, Paul, uh, page okay. 127, um, compliance with standards. So it is there, chapter 51, common rules, compliance with standards. Every item of equipment shall comply with the rel shall. Is that word shall again? It's a shall again, Comply yes. with the relevant requirements of the applicable British or harmonised standard appropriate to the intended use of the equipment. Yeah, and so, this is in the um, EV charging bit as well, because on, on that amendment that just came out, it says EV charging equipment shall comply with the appropriate parts of BSEN 61851. See, and, now, yeah. they've gone a step further in BS 7671 because the legal requirement is compliance with the machinery directive or in the case of the charge point on the low voltage directive but um the requirements of bs 761 have gone one step further and said you must comply with the harmonized standard okay so that's, let me that's... let me play devil's advocate here chaps so we've just highlighted so regulation 511.1 john what was the other regulation for those listening it's in um, section 72 it's the same number it's it's 722 511 Point one and 101. So they've repeated that again. OK, fine. Yeah. So, gents, now let's take a step up into the legal obligation. So I've got with me, if you're watching, the electricity work regulation. And it says regulation five. No electrical equipment shall be put into use where its strength and capability may be exceeded in such a way. Give rise to danger. Now, you need to think about that. You need to think about the strength and capability, the rating. The fault. And the only, sometimes the only way you're going to do this is by doing some due diligence. But the fact of the matter is, is there is a lot of um, parts of the electricity at work regulations that are shalls. And the legal obligation is on you. And the only reason why there may not be a legal obligation on you is because you're sitting there saying it will never happen to me. And you're playing a uh, uh, unlucky or a, uh, a oblivious game of chance. Um, now, John, I believe you have found a perfect example of a product which we can um, we can discuss now. Um, now, we're all big fan of uh, Wagos. I call them Wagos, but they're Vargos. Yeah, which, uh, they're are Wagos, the, aren't they, really? That's just uh, Wagos, how yeah, it works in this country. This, this <laughs> is how we talk in this country. We, we, we call them way, potato, potato, isn't it? Wago, Vargo. Indeed. Yeah. So we have Wargos, Wargos. Well done. <laughs> oh, there we go. We have Wargos, Varg, well, blah, 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 blah. We, we have Wagos in this country. Great little revolutionary connector, as long as they're installed correctly and not floating, um, as a lot of people we see do use them just floating. Mm. But John, you have found uh, another product, um, which is basically, if for all intentional purposes, looks like a Wargo, um, Wago, sorry. Um, what is these things? Because they're sold by Tool Station. Yeah, these are, I mean, they look physically identical, but the difference is they're not the same colour, and obviously they're not made by the Wago people at all. Um, and they've got, the difference is they've got coloured levers. These ones are brown, yellow, and blue so, for some reason. I'm just going to share my screen so that everybody can see that if they're watching on YouTube. So can you see that? Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen? Okay, so for everyone watching, this is the brown, uh, yellow, and blue inline 32-amp three-pole uh, spring lever connectors they look like a fancy um vargo catalog page 582 um so that's that's what it is on the um tool station website anyway sorry john please carry yeah. on yeah i mean the thing with these is it doesn't say who manufactures these or what standards they comply with or whether they're ce marked or in fact anything at all it's just a question of here's this product please buy it and and that's it and so, they need uh, to be C marked in accordance with the low voltage directive. That's what the law says. So there is a, an actual standard for connectors, which there are so many. Once we start covering standards lists, 
those out there who are probably saying, well, you should know this to me, about me by now. You cannot remember. I mean, when you're talking about the the um, C marking directive, for, so the machinery directive, the C marking for machinery, there's probably over 200 standards just for the machinery directive. That's without the low voltage directive because they're not duplicated. We'll come into that another. Uh, we might cover that later. So, um, Paul, just just I think it's BSE NIEC six one zero seven six dash two dash one 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 connectors for electrical and electronic equipment product requirements. Um, but this is for oh no, hang on, no, there you go. There's me thinking ahead of myself. This is just for M twelve screw connectors. Oh so yeah, this yeah, immediately yeah, tells yeah. you there is bloody loads of connectors for right. different appliances. Nope. The ones you got there, Paul, um, yeah. those guys who work in industry will relate to this from, with me now. Um, yeah. You've got plug-in connections on the back of a proximity switch that you four pin, five pin. You plug yeah. them in, then you screw them up. They've got a, an orientation groove in them. Those are the sort of connectors you're talking about. There. So that's just one circular connector with three, four, five pins designed to work at extra low voltage, possibly IP rated to maybe 68. Um, and that's all it covers. That's all of that standard covers. You know, there are thousands of the damn things. I tell you what, as we're talking about standards, and Paul's yeah. looking for numbers there. I I'll am just cover, looking. I'll just cover briefly why why these standards are so important. Now, in the front of BS seven six seven one, we have an introduction written by the uh, safety executive, saying that. Um, a fixed wiring installation in a building, I'm, I'm making my own words up here now, a fixed wiring installation in a building is likely to comply with the LTC work regulations if it's in compliance with BS7671. It's a kind of unofficial recommendation come kind of endorsement that, you know, comply with BS7671, you should be okay, mate, you know? Yeah. It's not a guarantee. It's not cast in stone. And if you look at the the covers of the standards, it says, you know, compliance with these standards does not confer an immunity from prosecution or does not ensure compliance with the law or words to that effect. But there is a much stronger link between the European legislation, the machinery directive, the low voltage directive and the EMC directive, as those are the three we're talking about, and with what they call the harmonized standards that are issued, the ENs. The BSENs, the BSEN ISOs, the BSEN IECs that we have. The only BS in this country, the rest of you, they're just ENs, or EN ISOs or EN IECs. Um, those standards are actually written by ISO, they're written by the IEC, and they are vetted, for want of a better way of putting it, against the requirements of the directives to ensure that if you follow the standard, you will meet the requirements of the directive. And the directives are written such that they say, if you follow the list of standards published in the European Journal and use those standards to comply with the EHSRs that are listed within them, you will comply with the legislation. So what they're saying there is, if you're building a machine and you follow the EN standards and you follow them to the letter, you will build a machine that complies with the essential health and safety requirements. And I'm going to immediately say there, for those who do doors and gates, and are throwing things at their radio now and saying, ah, but, yes, one of the doors and gate standards, and I can't remember the number of it at the moment, it's just been redone, and it's nearly there, I think, doesn't actually cover the essential health and safety requirements adequately to meet the requirements. HSC put an objection into... The European Union, the European Union upheld that um, that uh, objection, and it was decreed that the standard wasn't adequate. So it's been rewritten once, and it's being rewritten again. So if you are doing doors and gates, Blimey. get hold of the DHA, the Dawn Hardware Federation, or the, I think it's Dawn Hardware Federation. They've got some good guidance out there, and you need to follow that in conjunction with following the harmonised standards. The next thing I'm going to say is, if you're a member of a scheme, be a seven six seven one scheme, nap it. Uh, I was going to say Strom then, but that's that's kind of no more. Tesco NIC, Value. ECA. Uh, there are others. And BSI still got a scheme going of there, I think. Anyway, uh, you know, we know, know the, the three big that. players are 
the ECA, the NIC, and, 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 and NIPIT, yeah? Yeah. So, if you remember one of those schemes, they insist that you have a copy of BS 7671. They do. The idea being, how can you work from a standard, or no, to a standard, I was going to say, but we shouldn't be working to it. We should be working from it. We should be, you know, it's minimum compliance, yeah? Um, how can you do that if you don't have a copy of it to refer to? And the same applies to the machinery stuff. If you're going to do machinery work, uh, you need copies of the standards that you're going to be working to. So, you know, EN60204, um, BS13850 for emergency stops. You need copies of these things. And, guys, if you think BS7671 is expensive, you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah, I can I can totally, totally back that up. So, Paul, while you've been talking, I've been looking at these. Um, again, it's a, a product from Tool Station that John was talking about. Inline spring lever connectors, three pole, 32 amp. Product code 78346, just for clarity. Now, they look fancy. Uh, looks like they're up to four mil connectors, inline connectors of a, a, a Wago type. Um, but the catalog page is there, but there's no technical data or compliance data that proves or evidences it. I can't see from the picture there's any CE marking. Now, mm. interestingly enough, if you use um, Wago as an example, so their electrical data, they've got compliance to a standard EN60664-1, um, which, funnily enough, is the insulation coordination for equipment standard. So this is more about the insulation um, of the Wagos that they provide. Funnily enough, that it's actually a pollution degree too, Paul. Oh, yeah. interesting. It is interesting. So putting that outdoors, if you're using Wagos outdoors... You're, yeah, you're, you're you're sailing very close to the wind, as they say. Yeah. So just yeah. on that, we're going to do a, we're going to do a podcast on pollution degrees, but pollution degrees um, are quite an interesting little yeah. subject matter for because what they do is they determine and drive where you place electrical equipment and how you place it. I think that's fair to say in the the big scheme of it. But we'll mm -hmm. we'll cover that on another podcast. So from this, it looks like um, the from the electrical data on Wago's website, it's an over voltage category two and a pollution degree two, which tells me um, that we shouldn't be using Vagos outside. Now I'm assuming that's uh, outside by themselves. Um, obviously, if you put enclosures and everything else, that yeah. they may be okay. But that's another chat for for Wago. And if anyone from Wago is listening or Vago feel free to get in touch with us and come on and, and let's talk about the product because I think they are, without a doubt, the replacement for connectors. Oh, yeah, but, I love them. But I, I am them. very seriously worried that Tool Station have a product and no evidence. So one piece of advice I have for anyone, um, if you can't see on the website evidence and, and a, a transparency of compliance, stay away. Oh, yeah, definitely. Stay away. Definitely. John, what's your thoughts on these? Because... Yeah, I mean, those tour station ones, I mean, the only information on there, there's a manufacturer ID, which is some code. But if you actually search that code, the only place it comes up with is tool station. So, yeah, it, it gives yeah. you nothing. And I think the problem is if you went and bought those and just assumed, oh, they're going to be absolutely fine. I mean, they might be. But of course, what if they're not? And what if one of them overheats and sets fire to someone's house? And then what are you going to do? You can say, oh, well, we bought them from such and such. But the, trou the trouble is not with these is you can see someone being tempted to just use this if they've damaged a cable under a floor. But I, I, the one thing I'm very hesitant about with these um, Wago type connectors is, yes, they're great for joining cables and connecting using minimal space, but they needed to be, the conductors and the terminations need to be protected against vibration, movement, and any stresses plain to put a, uh, against the termination. And just using them floating is not really good practice. Um, but it it does tend to happen quite a lot, and I'm I'm that's one of the negatives I think of of poor use or poor selection and erection of a Wago type um, connector. But I mean, to be honest with you, lads, I'm going to go and buy one of these tomorrow. So I'll, I will I'll take some pictures and let you know see if there's any markings on the back of them. But yeah. I mean, it should have the details on the product and the packaging, obviously. On the packaging, it should say on the packaging. Right. So let's 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 go to see what 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 should it. What should it have on it? Well, um, it should have a CE mark on it. Yeah, which doesn't mean Chinese export for the avoidance of doubt. Uh, yes. No, there is um, 
There's a there's a frequently asked question on the Euro in the on the European um, p- uh, professional guidance site, and basically the the consensus amongst the industry, the CE market industry, the, um, the consultants and, and my peers is that we feel that the C the Chinese export mark is more than likely come about because a Chinese company tried to C mark their own product, and they didn't put the C marking on correctly. Which is a criminal offence in itself, believe it or not. If you're gonna, the C mark is a bit like, um, it's a bit like it is it's trademark. copyright it, theft. It's, it's a copyright, copyright theft. Thing. Yeah, yeah. So the European Union allows you to put that on, as long as you put it on in the correct format. And if you get the C mark in directive, it actually shows you the format. It's I don't know how much you can see in the camera. It's two interlocking circles. Yeah, yeah. And the and they're exactly the same thickness. One of them is being cut off at 180 degrees. The E. And the leg in the middle is yeah, shorter, I, and it, there's I, a particular geometrical structure. I think for those listening, it's probably worth a Google or a or, yeah. or a looking we're up. Not, but it's we're, it's we're, the same principle as if you use the NIC EIC logo without permission of the NIC. You're committing fraud by declaring that you're registered with the NIC. Yeah, if you use not. the E5 logo, I will hunt you down and and just kill you. Um, um, same thing. It's a we're a trademark. Well, it's a trademark brand, isn't it? Yeah, if you use it without permission, I can sue you. And the European Union, European Union allows you to use that trademark brand free of charge, yeah. without recourse, as long as you meet the requirements for applying it to your product. Yes. Not too much to ask, is it? You know? Now because this is what where... that C mark does is gives you free access to the whole of the European marketplace. This is where Paul, we're gonna end up we're gonna do a s we're gonna do a separate podcast on this to do some case studies because mm-hmm. when you go into these standards, you go into a rabbit's warren of various choices and options that you can make various standards were so for instance if you have a standard a product standard for a printer that that standard will apply but if you then put that printer in a piece outside or in a different location the requirements of the build and then the 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 components may change due to the nature where you've installed it now luckily the standards they all go through that but someone has to do the work to have gone through it and one of the things that i found since i've started challenging the manufacturers and a lot of this sits at manufacturing pool mm. a lot of the manufacturers will not share with you the data they won't share it because they'll say gdpr uh, we can't share it rubbish so agree to sign an nda go there and review it for yourself and i guarantee you um you will find issues if you start digging not yeah. for every manufacturer but for definitely for some of them it's not it's not so much gdpr to be fair it's more i use that as a veil it's... though yeah, I mean, this, but this has been going on for many years. It's down yes. to the fact that a, a technical file, a correctly compiled technical file, which we'll cover again when we cover directors in detail, but that's what the document is called. It would give, if you handed that over to your to the company's competitor, would give them, without any having to do any R&D, the ability to copy that product in full yes. and make an exact, effectively photocopy without incurring any R&D costs. So that technical file is has so much intellectual property in it. That's why the manufacturers don't want to give you access. So, John, when you're doing your teardowns of your Chinese export stuff that you famously do in your wonderful videos, um, what you did completely wrong was you didn't say to that person you were who was exporting it, can I please see a copy of your technical file? Um, and that's a valid point you've just raised there, Paul. So for any electrician listening, um, any manufacturer who brings a product onto the market should have a technical, used to be called technical construction file. Now it's just a technical file where they effectively file and put all of their testing, their declarations, conformity, all the evidence to allow them to market that product as safe and fit for use. And, and prove that it meets the requirements of the directive. Indeed. Now, officially, the only people who can demand that file are Her Majesty's Health and Safety Executive. Yes. Now, if you're a, if you're a, a large buyer like yourself, Paul. Yes. Uh, and like I guide, if I'm if I'm working for, I, I have two hats. Sometimes I work for end users. Sometimes I work for machine manufacturers. Now, if I'm working okay. for an end user, I will recommend that the end user. You, some of you are going to laugh at this. I will recommend that the end user tries to see, or tries to verify for themselves that the technical file exists or can be compiled. It doesn't have yep. to be on paper. It can be electronic. Have they done their due diligence and have they put that documentation together? Do they know what's needed? Can they reassure you that 
if they fit, if Paul buys a a little like you no, know, he, he, you haven't got so much risk now. But if Paul was on the underground and he fitted a load of lights in his station, and can he reassure himself that the manufacturer of those lights has done their due diligence to ensure that they're safe, that they're not going to catch fire, and God forbid, we're not going to have another King's Cross on our hands mm-hmm. caused by those lights. So what yep. Paul is looking for is to give himself that 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 confidence that the manufacturer has assessed all these things, followed the standards, done the temperature rise calculations, done the the, the thermal testing on the materials, the flammability yep. testing to make sure that it meets all these requirements. You know, and, and that final declaration of conformity should come with the product. So just so, just to put that into a little bit more context, Paul, you're well, absolutely you're absolutely bang on right. So I used to work for TFL. And I would insist upon seeing this. And I think it's fair to say, all things being open and honest, there were manufacturers that we approached for their declarations of conformity and their technical files, and they just fell apart at the seams because they'd never done the work. Now, when you look at a product, you're absolutely right. So from an electrician's perspective, if John is installing some floodlights outside a house, John will immediately go IP rating. IP65, IP67, and he'll then go IK rating, which is your impact resistance. Well, you know, it's in an alleyway, so we'll go for an IK10, you know, reasonably solid um, luminaire that can take a bit of a kicking. And he may select an erector conduit system and all the rest of it. So that's what he'll do. But there's other tests like glow wire tests, you know, um, uh, voltage creep tests. There'll be tests where moisture, you know, how it performs under moisture, to see if there's any tracking or, 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 or leakage on how the drivers perform under temperatures, you know, um, salt mist tests, all of those external influences that are in Appendix 5. The these, products, these products will be put, hopefully, uh, under, the, under the microscope for this. Because if you're buying a luminaire and you put it, say, uh, you say, well, I want it to go near a seaside and then it corrodes within 12 months. Who's liable? What if that corrodes to a point where it fails and inj- falls off a wall and injures a family? You know, so where do you stop? But it's it's just just f- for sparks who are doing day to day selection erection. There is an assumption all this stuff is done because you should, to a certain extent, presume this is done. However, the nature of the industry and manufacturers and what me and you have seen in our careers, it's fairly evident that they're not done. And I know John Ward has tested stuff that, John, you would definitely say is non-compliant to anything. Yeah, definitely. We uh, <laughs> say some of that stuff, it's just horrible. I mean, say a lot of that obviously came directly from China. But I say that the problem is now you've got stuff in the UK for sale, like those connector things you saw there, which uh, may or may not comply and where they came from and who knows. So, yeah. So, so let's go back to those connectors for a second. I say, the, you know, you wouldn't expect a nicely folded A4 piece of paper in that box with those connectors of the Declaration of Conformity. That might be a bit much to expect, yeah? But yeah. what I would expect is on the outside of the box is a web link to the manufacturer's website and a unique part number, manufacturer's part number for those connectors. Yeah. So you can go to that website, go to their documentation, put that part number in and obtain the Declaration of Conformity. Because strictly speaking, you should be supplying that. If you're as a new build, commercial builder, you're using those connectors, that declaration of conformity should go in the O&M manuals for the building. Yeah, and, and that's a valid point because one of the things that we, we seem to forget, especially the non-domestic guys, is every single component we select and erect or we buy, there should be traceability on it because we should have traceability of if you've bought a luminaire from a manufacturer it will go in the O&M that look manufacturer should be able to say yes there was an order placed it was a compliant product etc because that product could fail kill someone hurt someone cause a fire you know heaven forbid cause a, a major major national incident you guarantee you people like yourself Paul will sit there and just go right I want to see the records when all these luminaires were bought if they're three years old I want to see you know the dockets the invoice somebody should have all of this data it should all be retained. The place where it falls flat is the domestic sector, John. Yeah, I mean, there's there's very little checking. People just buy any old stuff from anywhere and sling it in and hope that it's going to work. And most of the time it does work. But of course, sometimes it doesn't and stuff goes wrong. And that's where you get all these problems. So. And that's the problem in the domestic world. Just because it works doesn't mean it's right. And, and, and this is it, one yeah. of my concerns, Paul, with the whole, um, you know, uh, the electronic products, all of the equipment that we're bringing in, if it's not compliant, 
Uh, the fact of the matter is, is uh, we've got too many manufacturers now saying in the domestic household uh, circuit breaker protection market, you know, if you buy a, a, um, a Bosch dishwasher or a Valiant boiler type B DC immunity. So they've obviously someone's done some due diligence there, you know, but that due diligence isn't publicly available. Um, oh, don't start frowning. You're on video. Remember, um, th th someone's done something somewhere to say we need to advise a suitable precaution. CYA. Sorry, what? CYA. What's CYA? Cover your ass. Oh, cover your, ass. cover your ass. I don't know that standard number. John, do you know that one? Yeah. CYA. <laughs> All they've done is they've just said, oh, well, just in case it's a problem, if we go over a Type B and they haven't fitted it and somebody gets killed, we're in the clear because they haven't fitted a Type B. Yeah. But they must don't know. Forget, I work, don't in. forget, I work not only with small companies in the UK. I was, I'm working, I'm doing a job at the moment for one of the biggest companies in the world. Which we're not going to mention any name whatsoever. No, and I'm going to stop you there completely. I cannot say. Right, cannot so there say. we go. We're not even going to give an inference on that. No, we're um, not. All right. I was going to say is they've made mistakes as well. Okay, right, moving on very yes. fast and quickly, um, at speed and at haste. <laughs> so what have we covered? We've covered some stuff on the machinery directive. So where Sparks are going to see it, roller shutter doors, gates, um, barriers, maybe car parks, merging into commercial now. Um, automatic garage doors. They come under the machinery directive. Yep. They do. They do. They do. And one of the things, if you remember, there's been a few high-profile cases recently a lady messing around whether she was drunk or going out for a drink she was i won't say high she was high on excitement yeah oh, she studying. was excited to be all going out for a drink or she'd come back from having a few beers or whatever oh and she for a minute i thought you were i thought you were going to say she was high and excited at seeing john ward's gate installation there for a minute <laughs> no no she jumped up and she grabbed hold of the roller shutter door as it was rising and she yeah, couldn't let one. go right and she got wrapped around the roller and killed Jesus wept. Yeah. Because the roller wasn't set up correctly. The force measuring wasn't set up correctly. The limits weren't set up correctly. And it took her through like a mangle. Jesus. Yeah, I read that one. They hadn't, I think, wasn't it that someone had actually supposedly done an inspection on it and they hadn't yeah. actually checked any of it and it was completely unsafe yeah. and they just signed yeah. a bit of paper, said, yeah, it's fine. And it obviously yeah. wasn't. So that, that, there's another thing, Paul, you've just reminded me of in the domestic world for machinery. So I've I've been talking to people recently and they've been put uh, they've been converting homes for um, vulnerable and disabled people. So, you know, now you can get like the railing systems. So if you're a disabled or, or mobility impaired person, um, oh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you yeah. can like get yourself patient, out of bed. They're the patient handling systems. But now. Um, I was speaking to a guy last week and all he does is basically put these monorail systems into houses now that allow a, a mobility impaired person to be able to get around the home, get changed, wash, clean up and, and give them freedom around the house. But all of that is motors and rails and chains and machinery directive stuff. And I mentioned I actually mentioned to him the machinery directive and he looked at me and it was just like, what's that then? Yeah. Yeah, it's... no, there, it might, there, might be, there might be one stage further than that, okay? Because they're for handling okay. people. They may come under the medical equipment directive. Okay. I don't know that one the the my head. Which means the, de the declaration conformity and the technical file yeah. must accompany the product. It is the one directive where the technical file must be made available to the end user. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Medical Products Directive. Now, we'd have to look into that because you've dropped that one on me and I'm not sure. If it was a monorail system for lifting crankshafts out of a... a no, this is, a for, bit, this is mobility yeah. impaired yeah. persons. No. Um, this is carrying humans lifting, up to 300 kilos. If it was for lifting lumps of cast iron out of a bin and putting them on a conveyor, I would have no qualms of saying Machinery Directive. Yep. But as it's for handling people... Um, it might be the machine directive, but it might because it's for handling vulnerable adults in medical situations and pseudo medical situations. It may well come under the medical equipment directive. OK, so let's um, let's take that offline and yeah. our next podcast yeah. will pick that up 
and we'll talk yeah. about machinery in the home because I want uh, this is going to be a difficult one for people who work in the domestic sector to listen to because they'll be screaming at their um, radios going, but what do I need to do to ensure my product? So I'm going to what I'm going to do is because we're getting close to the hour, I want to kind of uh, start to wrap this up and I want to give a piece of advice to people just on the domestic sector first and then we'll go around. OK, so if if like this, um, this tool station product, the way we can't see evidence of conformance and there's no transparency in their declarations of conformance, which nowadays, if you're putting together a little pack for a rewire, you should be able to just download the data sheets, put it in a pack, issue it to the homeowner and say they're all the products and materials I've used. If they're not giving you that um, uh, level of assurance. Now, it can just be a sheet that says this is built to the relevant BSEN or IEC standards. But if they're not giving you that insurance, then don't shop with them. Go and find somebody else who will give you that level of assurance. Yeah, stick. This I say. Um, I've said it. I've written an article. I wrote an article for the Nappy Common and Bristol Magazine. I've just written another one for for one of you the have. other um, trade journals, which is going through editing at the moment. And that's what I've said. Is look. I know it's tempting to buy offline online. I know it's tempting to buy on the on, on the online marketplaces because the stuff is cheap and you can make a good margin on it. And there's nothing dirty about profit. A company has to make profit. Yes, absolutely. To survive. Agree. It's not a disgust. It's not an abhorrent thing. You have to make a profit. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Making an obscene amount of profit at the expense of others is something different. Yeah, profiteering. But to a thing. don't just buy any old tat from anywhere guys stick with the brand names there's a reason that they're more expensive the reason is they've done their due diligence that they've got all this information to back you up that yeah. if something does go wrong the declaration of conformity is there and they've got all this information in place so this is one of the primary yeah. reasons that i've actually been able to do some due diligence for schneider and as a client i'm picking schneider as a common product across my railway because I know I've got that backup in those technical yeah. files, the, a large company, yeah. obsolescence proof into an extent, um, availability of parts, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what you were saying there, really, although you were giving a great piece of advice to people not to buy cheap, what you should have done is actually said, John, stop feeding the machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, oh no actually i'm going to rephrase that just for everyone listening john ward uh, and his wonderful youtube channel um john only purchases this equipment or is sent this equipment for entertainment and viewing pleasure only he never actually endorses the buying of these products or anything else um that's probably why you set fire to them in all fairness yeah <laughs> so <laughs> So let's get back, getting back quickly then to the to the domestic spark. So if you haven't got that assurance, you know, like I was saying earlier on, the box. Let's let's take those tool station connectors. We're not berating those tool station connectors. There may be the evidence behind them. What we're saying at this point is we can't see it on the website. Yes, and yeah. and this is this is one of the first stages of transparency checking. Is if I'm going online to screw fix and everything else, it should be free to say we manufacture it to this product, whether it be insulation, pollution degree, whatever it is. There should be a whole suite of standards that or a at link least to the manufacturer's can... website. Yes, where you can get all that information. So yeah. you know when when Paul goes and buys his box of these tomorrow from Tool Station and comes home, there might be a web link on the box, and he goes, oh, there's a web link there, and there's a part number, and he goes on the web link, and he and it says um, you know documents at the top. And he just clicks the documents button, there's a search box comes up and he puts the search number in and up comes this raft of instructions and technical information and declaration of conformity and all the stuff where they've done all their due diligence and it's all there on the website. There's nothing wrong with that if it's there because to provide all that with a connect, a box of connectors that costs a couple of pounds is overboard. Yeah. But they should be able to give you access to that information. Yeah, they have to be able to Easy. give you a level of, at the end of the day, it's a level of confidence. But I think mm -hmm. as you'll find um, for those listening um, and watching, as we go through, um, we delve deeper into um, directives and all the standards around it. Um, it is, and, and I have learned of this in recent years, the level of complexity when you put one simple electrical component together with another electrical component and another, and then you put belts and drives and all sorts, it gets very, very complex and one can interact with the other and affect the other's compliance and you may have to change and upgrade and it, it's there's a level of engineering logic and due diligence done in machine and component and product um, purchasing that is absolutely off the charts but we as electricians don't see it and we presume that most of this is done 
Um, I think in the lighting industry for the domestic guys, you only got to go on Twitter to see the number of failures of self-contained LED fire rated lights. You know, it, the failure rates some of them have got, guys will just swear off of them straight away. They won't go near them. But yet yeah. you'd wonder, hang on a minute, if this is a fire survival luminaire, it's supposed to give you 30, 60, not, I think there was one product on so, Twitter the other week, 30, 60, 90, and 120 minutes it had on the box. So I would expect, if they're claiming 120, 120 minutes fire resistance, yeah. uh, and that's a, that's a critical thing. So we're going back to documentation that you would expect. I would expect them to be putting things like independent test results up on their website to yep. give you the confidence that it's going to meet. Because if it's going to meet the 120, it's going to meet the 90, it's going to meet the 60, it's going to meet the 30. Yeah, indeed. So all they need to do is put up the most onerous one and job done. But if that sort of level of information isn't there, if the C mark isn't there, if the part number isn't on it, it's probably not the sort of thing you want to be using. Um, and this is what I like about companies like Doncaster Cable and um, um, Prismium and stuff like that. You, they're now inviting electricians into their factory to show them, um, you know, some of the experiments, some of the products, they, to give the installers more confidence. And this is what I, I, I like about Kirsty at Surge Protection. They're very transparent. They're very open. They're very honest. Um, they'll tell you the goods. They'll tell you the bads. Um, and if you question them and they, and they don't know or they, you may have identified a gap, the good ones will work with you. The bad ones will have an argument and hide behind GDPR. Well, that's what I there found. Was a, there was a, uh, a gentleman um, touting his um, LED lights on one of the social media platforms going back look, maybe a year or two back now. Okay. And um, and, and uh, he was saying, oh, they're this, they're that. They're that. Oh, great. No problem. I got a client that wants a few thousand but he's going to need all the photobiological data up front to inv yeah, and all the, so. all the documentation to evaluate that the lighting is, is suitable and adequate and sufficient for his, his needs. Yep. The guy disappeared off social media that night, never to be seen again. Uh, con man. Yeah. yeah. How many people are in this country selling tubes and LED retrofits and all the rest of it? And, and it's the poor installer that has to mop it up. Yeah. Cheap so, 300 for 300 panels. The Yeah. Yeah. 300 600 sorry what talking about square panels yeah, yeah so so basically that's what we're saying yeah. is is look at the product make sure it's got the c mark on it say something like small connector you wouldn't expect all the information to come with it but you'd expect an easy means of getting that information and that's you know that's talking now low voltage directive products that the um that the the domestic electrician is going to be looking to buy from the wholesalers stick with the reputable wholesalers there are reputable wholesalers online and, and is it there are reputable wholesalers who trade solely online. It's worthwhile reminding people this low voltage directive, um, which is um, it's it's got a strange number, 2014 backslash 35 backslash EU, has been applicable since 20th of April 2016. It applies to household appliances, cables, power supply units, laser equipment, fuses, MCBs, um, all sorts of um, pretty much everything we use as electrical contractors and installers. Pop quiz. Oh, go when on. was the first low voltage directive? I'm going to have a pop. I'm going to go. I'm going to take a guess here. John's got to participate in this. I'm going to put. Without, say, without searching. I'm not searching. My hands are here. I'm going to say 1991. John? I'm going to say some like 1980s sometime. 1973. Oh. Could human beings read back then? Yeah, of course we could. Um, wow. Okay, I was totally out. But then again, I'm a that man. Was, that 90s. was brought into UK law in 1975. So this is not new legislation, guys. So hang on, this was brought into law before the Health and Safety at Work Act even existed. It oh no, sorry, just after, after, just after, the year after in UK law. My yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. So this has been this, you know, the same kind of time, virtually as long. You know, statutory instrument 1975-1366 was the first electrical equipment safety regulations. So uh, I think it's a good piece of CPD for people to go into because I, I think one of the things I have found from personal experiences is once you start looking at the directives, some of it you'll read and go, oh, my God, that's such common sense. But then other bits you'll read and go, wow, wow there's a lot of other standards I didn't know existed. When you start looking yeah. into them standards, and I remember the first standard I ever looked at, I straight away, as you just said, Paul, went, where's the photobiological data for this? And the manufacturers just went, pardon? 
And I literally quoted the BSEN number and they were like, oh, um, yeah, we haven't done that yet. But the product's for sale. You're selling this product. What Have you done any due diligence, any of the checks? This okay. is one of the reasons I'm not a massive fan of LED, to be perfectly frank. But Yeah, um, and I'm not going to argue with that. So yeah. um, so we've covered kind of stuff, I think, for the, for the, for the domestic electrician requiring for the – they need to check and stuff for the low voltage directive. Yep. When it comes to they start doing gates, right, um, gates, doors, stuff like that, they will not come with a declaration of conformity. A roller shutter door, let's take a, a roller shutter door or a garage door, and the door opener and stuff, they will come with a declaration of incorporation because as it stands, they can't do anything useful. They have to be fitted into a building to do something useful. So therefore, they have to incorporate it into something. So they shouldn't be CE marked. Unless the motor drive unit has to comply with the low voltage directive and is available on its own, in which case that would be. So the door and drive unit and everything as an assembly would come with a declaration of incorporation. This is the document, this is the name. And it should come with integration instructions to enable the installer to install it and commission it for it to be safe. And once they've done that, the legal requirement for the installer is that they complete the declaration of conformity and compile the technical file, or at least are able to compile the technical file when required by the health so and safety just, executive. Just to be clear here, Paul, because you are going yep. deep and meaningful, um, this is when an electrical contractor is taking multiple components and building them together to make something of relevance. They then take on the responsibility for the compliance and the integration. Yeah, or as, right. a, as, okay. a, as, a, as an electrical contractor buying an up and over garage door and mm -hmm. fitting it for a domestic client, yeah. They become the manufacturer of that door as fitted into the building. So they are legally responsible as manufacturer. They need to be insured for that too. And many mm -hmm. electrical contractors' policies do not insure for that. Yeah, this gates and thing. I mean, it's if you if you you can obviously buy kits and things from various yes. sources, some of which are better yeah. than others. But if you buy a kit for say electric gates and then you fit them together, that isn't in itself compliant you've got to then fit them together in a way that they are compliant and you Correct. are responsible for sure that because right. yeah. obviously if you buy a load of stuff and just install it there's all kinds of ways you could put it together and you could put it together wrongly and it could have mm -hmm. bits that don't comply and yeah unfortunately gates in yeah. particular if they don't have the safety devices on their default operation is basically crush kill destroy because yeah. if they're going to open and crush people and close and all the rest of it so yeah, if you're going to buy gates, don't expect the gate equipment to come with any of this stuff because it's up to the person putting it together to make sure it complies to all these directives. Because Hang on the, a minute. The, Hang on a minute. Hang on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Stop, 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 stop. stop. Places and ways. Stop, stop. Hang on a minute. Crush, kill, destroy, John. Yeah. That's oh, right. right. Oh, this, come come, we're, getting come. A whole new, we're getting a whole new side of job morning. Crush, kill, destroy. <laughs> Next, you'll be saying yeah. that those, those connectors need to go in your big box of rubbish. Um, no, but the well, gates, the gates what, come without any safety devices. We'll talk about that later. Um, yeah. Sorry, you were saying, Paul? So the, the, most gates come without any safety devices. It's down to the installer to install and commission safety devices and prove that those safety devices work and do what they should do. And the other thing that a lot of people don't realise is there's force limits that these things are all, there are, must be a maximum force limit. For example, when a roller shutter door comes down, when a yeah. gate is closed in. There's a maximum force limit, and you have to measure that force limit on site as installed and record yes. it. If and you don't, you're not compliant. So that's the same as, funny enough, uh, London Underground gate lines. They have a force limit on them. It's the same, um, and it it's was, the same it legislation, was, mate. It was this, yeah, it was. If I could let me give people an example so that they can yeah. visually see it. It was in case where people get trapped in gate lines, it doesn't crush you. And the worst case scenario was a small child. If they got their head crushed, you wouldn't want it you know causing them yeah. serious injury um so they were tested every single time but um yeah uh, it's 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 fascinating really to be honest with you because there's so much knowledge out there that we just maybe don't consider or maybe we just take complacently um i think that's probably it but um just looking at the time yeah um, one last thing i'd like to say is about emc because we haven't really covered that uh, very uh, briefly for the domestic spark because okay. we're going to cover the three directives very briefly. I will be brief on this one. On is the key with the MC for the domestic electrician is follow the manufacturer's instructions. Yes. If the manufacturer's nice instructions don't come with the product, find another product. Simple. I, I yeah, I think that's some really salient good 
sage advice, to be perfectly frank. And and I think we'll listen. We'll we'll end up doing a podcast on EMC. I've got some contacts in the EMC world, and I will get them on here because I'm owed a few favors from York EMC and a few TUV and all that. So I'll get some of the EMC experts onto these podcasts. And um, uh, that's really it Do for a job now. With York at the moment. <laughs> Well, let me, Paul, let me finish this and we'll, we'll do another one oh, where worries. we carry this debate on because yep. there's tons to talk about. So um, for everybody listening, thank you very much for putting up with our ramblings for the last hour. Hopefully Sorry this... if we've bored you. No, you haven't bored us, but thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for watching. And um, we will cover more directives, more hidden gems, more engineering logic, engineering thought processes. We'll debate this a bit more. We'll get some industry experts in um, o- over time. And um, until the next one, Paul, you're a legend. John, you know you are. And um, I'm Paul. Uh, take care of yourself and each other. Bye-bye. And I'm Paul too. Good night. Bye.